Welcome back. Um, today I'm very excited because after going from the mists of time, if you will, and talking about cave art, La, La Altamira, Lascaux, the Willendorf Venus, today we're going to talk about a civilization that is still fascinates us today. We look at movies about it, there's crazies about it, you still, you know, you walk like an Egyptian, you know. So it's Egypt, right? The Egyptians have exerted a remarkable fascination on Western culture for forever. Why? Because pretty much Egypt is the foundation of Western civilization. A lot of our stuff comes from the Greeks, and guess what? The Greeks got it from the Egyptians. So we have that sort of a transmission. And um, there is this also this incredible sort of uh, fascination with the rigidness. It's stone, it's massive. Remember we talked about massive when we talk about uh, our uh, sculpture. Uh, it's massive, they're really big uh, sculptures. And, um, and it didn't change. Like Egyptian art has this remarkable continuity for like 10,000 years. And so why is that? And this is geography and geography is destiny. We're also going to talk about another very ancient civilization, the civilization of the Near East, right? Of Iraq, of that fertile crescent, and that changes all the time. Well, it's got to do with geography. Where is Egypt? Desert. The desert, that's right. And in that desert, you, you know, nobody comes, nobody goes, nobody comes. So that amazing circumstance made the art very, very uh, still, it didn't change so much. So, and uh, it's decisive for the Greeks. So we'll go 3,000 years before Christ, right? That's the first dynasty. 3,000 years before uh, Christ, we divide, um, we divide Egyptian history in dynasties, right? And um, like, like I said, 3,000 years before Christ. And we have basically three, you know, first dynasty. 3,000 years before Christ, and then we talk about the Old Kingdom, then we talk about the New Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. So these are the eras of Egyptian art. Now I can get very specific with the numbers, but let me tell you something. Why don't we do this 3 to 2, 3,000 to 2,000 years before Christ, then we're going to go to, to like maybe, um, to, to like maybe 1500, that would be the Middle Kingdom, and then from 1500 to 1000, that's the New Kingdom. Okay, there's some little variances in that, but that, that's even numbers. 3 to 2, 2 to 1, 2 to 1500, 1500 to 1. So you have the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Who is the supreme ruler of, of, of Egypt? The Pharaoh, all right? The Pharaoh is uh, the chief kahuna there. And basically, how do they come up with this Pharaoh? There is a theory that the Pharaohs are probably the descendants of those people that tamed the river, of hydraulics, of being able to tame that great Nile River with a rich <coughs> silk hand, okay? that got very, very uh, enriched and was uh, good for cultivation. So we have the pharaoh, the descendant of the engineers that control the water, okay? And, uh, and basically, how do we know about these people? How, how do all our knowledge of the Egyptians come from the tombs, okay? From the remarkable repositories for the deceased that the Egyptians created, especially the pharaohs, right? The more important in society, the bigger the tomb. And basically for the Egyptians, life was a road to the grave, okay? And they believed in spirit. Ka, the spirit of the individual, right? Is also what endures, what continues after death, because there is no fear. When we're done here, we die, we go on to another life, and you see it. They prepare the tomb. The tomb has your favorite things, your prized possessions. Hell, they would even kill some women to, to join you in the afterlife, right? The, the, the wives and stuff, they will kill them. Here, so you can have your, your, your wife. So that is kind of the idea. The beginning in the old kingdom, there doesn't seem to be fear about death. 
that fear develops to, as we go through the middle and particular the new kingdom. And also there is the appearance of judgment towards more recent times. Then they started factoring some judgment that you would get judged for your, um, for your, um, what you did in this earth. Now, the most important, the first historical piece of art I'm going to show you. And what is history? Recording. So the first historical piece comes from Egypt in the Western world because Egypt has writing. The writing of Egypt is called hieroglyphs. So Egypt is the first Western historical society. Egypt has writing called hieroglyphs. And this is the first historical piece in the West. It's called King Narmer's Palette. Look at King Narmer's Palette, right? It's like, it's made of stone. It is heavy. And basically, um, I think it's from 3000, 3000 and change, you know, it's old kingdom. It's, it's old kingdom, it's the oldest of the old. And basically it commemorates the union of Egypt. Egypt was the Nile Delta towards the north and then the southern part of Egypt, you know, lower down, right, inland. And they came together uh, under uh, Upper Egypt um, because they won over Lower Egypt. And Narmer is the guy that brings them together. So again, this is the oldest historic uh, work of art that we know. You can see Narmer. Narmer is barefoot, okay? That, that's how gods, gods don't need shoes. Gods are barefoot, so Narmer is associated with the god. He's also bigger than all the other figures in the palette, okay? And of course, there are icons. You think icons are new because of Apple and Mac? And all. There have been icons all throughout history, and here you have the icon symbolizing upper, and the upper left, you know, you see the, the, the icon of upper Egypt, you know, uh, the god Horus. Um, dominating the papyrus. Horus is the bird, the papyrus are the little stems, so you see that symbol right there, okay? Um, you see Narmer. Narmer wears the bull's tail because he is like the bull. The bull is a sacred animal in the West for a long time. It's been all throughout the Mediterranean. It has remarkable associations in the Near East, and even here in Egypt, you have a bull's tail to show that this guy is the boss. And then you also see decapitated bodies. Art has always also represented violence because for a long, long time, ever since we started reproducing, we've also been violent. So here you see the decapitated heads, you know, decapitated bodies, I'm sorry, um, showing King Narmer's victory over his enemies. You see hieroglyphics. This piece is, has writing and um, and you can look at the hieroglyphs in the piece. And what about the space? You know, I ask you to consider space when you write about the, in this class. You look at the pictorial convention. What is the space like, okay? So you have horizontal bands. There are several horizontal bands of space here. Uh, people appear on the ground, you know, they look crazy, they look different, but they, their size reflects their importance. I mean, these people are very conscious, like we are. Oh, she's wearing Gucci. Oh, that guy has the newest sneakers from Air Jordan. They were just like us, and they want to reproduce that by putting King Narmer is the biggest, King Narmer's deputies are bigger, and then the poor schmucks that got slaughtered, they're really small, okay? So basically, that's, that's that. The other thing that's super noticeable in Egyptian art, you never see people looking face front. People are always looking profile. The bodies are in the front, but then, you know, like, then the, the, the legs and stuff. So there's that joke about walk like an Egyptian. Basically, there's that. There is no movement. The art of Egypt is supposed to be hieratic. Hieratic means very still. So this is a hieratic art because perhaps we're talking of a society that's very stable. Where is European, where is the Egyptian civilization born out of? The desert. The desert. So they're out there in the desert. There is no company, so they do stuff very, very still. Now, we talked a little bit about that, but what do we all know about Egypt? What is the building that we all know about Egypt? 
pyramids. We got the pyramids, and the pyramids are, you know, a symbol, a symbol of Egypt. Te theories of mysteries, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the masons, the people that know how to build, they put a little pyramid in their work. I mean, the pyramids are just still exert a remarkable fascination. I've never been, I, and I really want to go to Egypt. I don't know when I'll get there, but I really want to go Cairo. I really want to go to Giza, check out those pyramids, because, I mean, come on, we, we all have to go. So, so the pyramids were not originally like this. Originally, they were like this, no tip, and they were called mastaba. And these mastabas were just like the tomb. The tomb is down here, and this is what you see on top of the sand, kind of like a monument for a, a, a dead person, right? And then they keep growing and growing and growing till the pharaoh makes it, right? A splendor, a splendor. And so, you know, um, we have in Egypt the first historical civilization, the first historical piece of art history in the West, King Narmer's Palace. We also have the first architect. We know of this guy that actually put his name on, on an architectural element, you know, near in, in, a, in a funerary complex. Okay, some kind of tomb set up. You got this guy called Imhotep. So we consider Imhotep the first architect, and he's associated with uh, King Djoser, with the king's funerary complex um, in, in Egypt. Now, of course, the most, and, and by the way, not only um, uh, do we have the, the sort of the first architect and stuff, but there's also a huge, a very important, um, what you would call it, uh, architectural element that also comes from Egypt, and that is Pillars. The column. The mm. column comes from Egypt and it was an engaged column. An engaged column means that the column is still stuck to a wall, right? It's not independent. The Greeks later brought the column out of the wall. But still, first columns come from Egypt, at least in Western Europe. I'm sure everybody has columns. You know, there's columns in China, there's columns all over, but that's how it works. Now, to finish off, let's just talk about a few, few, um, pyramids, you know, the great pyramids of Egypt. And we have um, in Giza, right there, we have Khufu. Khufu is the largest and the oldest, kind of 2,500, remember 2,500. Khafre, Khafre is the medium pyramid, okay? And basically we're talking about, yeah, 2,500 too, like after the other 20, you know, 2,500. And basically um, the last one is Menkaure. So we got, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaure. And of course, these are all pharaohs. These are all great pharaohs, and they start, like I said, 2600, 2500, and 2500, so, something like that. You can look at the numbers in your, in your uh, I have these notes for you, okay? So don't tell me, oh, I can't understand you. I'm doing this because I really want this exchange for you to get the enthusiasm. I really miss you. I'd rather be in China hanging out, but this is what we can do this year. So check it out, check your notes. You can get the specific dates for each, um, for each pyramid. And again, the pyramids are the burial chambers of the pharaoh. Now this guy, Afri, he is also the pharaoh that is the face of the sphinx, of the great sphinx of Giza, you know, like the cat with the pharaoh, that's, that's him. So take a look at that, you know, and you know, and see also with time how the pyramids went down in scale, how art went down in scale. So you could have a Marxist reading of this saying that the people got more power and you could no longer have this huge amount of slaves devoted to one man's whim. So scale is an issue and we could do a Marxist reading of this and see how perhaps after the initial Great Pyramid, people didn't allow or there was resentment and you couldn't get large amounts of people, so many people to work in one project. So they keep going down. Now, another huge thing about Egypt. So Egypt is the first historical civilization. Egypt is, hey Ty, how are you man? Hey, hey Ty, Ty, Ty. 
Anyway, um, Egypt is the first historic civilization. Egypt also has columns, super important. And Egypt also has portrait busts. Egypt has remarkable portraits. Yes, there are portraits. And I will end this class a little later on with a portrait of Nefertiti, of one of the great pha women pharaohs of Egypt. And look at this picture, like she's like, she, she wears Chanel, she's probably the head of a, of a super corporate thing today. I mean, this woman looks really, really sharp. So basically, um, just know that uh, in uh, Egyptian history, I would like you to remember also that um, there is a, there is a arch from glad to sadness, okay? First, you have the grandeur of the old kingdom, but in the middle kingdom, the Egyptians got invaded. Somebody went through that desert. Somebody went and got to them. It's called the Hyksos. So there is sadness in the art towards the tail end. And also, perhaps the influence, Near Eastern influence, because all of a sudden, also, you have one king, one pharaoh, starts believing in one god. That was only one phenomenon very briefly in the New Kingdom, but you had an incredible, an incredible change for one, for, for one, uh, for one pharaoh, Amenhotep. Amenhotep the fourth came up with a monotheistic, all right, religion for Egypt, a, a, a place that has many, many gods. So um, I'm going to just show you a few more images now, uh, just so you can admire and, uh, and enjoy the remarkable legacy of Egyptian art. Thank you.